Hello and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming, a show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. This episode, we are going to complete the first era, first part of the Napoleonic era, in the game Victory and Glory, Napoleon, by Glenn Drover, and published by Forbidden Games. Now, before we get into this last turn here, uh, a couple of things. First of all, one thing I want to point out to you here, and I have it up here on the map just to make it easier to see. Uh, if you take a look here, look how much is left of this deck uh, after you shuffle. So a lot of the cards you're never going to see again, so keep that in mind as you're playing the game. Uh, the first time you go through the, the mini time period here, this one here, the um, 1796 to 1801 period, you're not going to see a lot of those cards again. So just bear that in mind uh, as you play the game. Other thing I want to point out is, again, part of my solo method is down here. Now I've got the cards ready for both sides here. Britain's on the left and uh, France is on the right. And basically what I do to kind of make things balanced is... I take the cards that were not played at all, that were left in the draw pile. Now in this case there's four and three, basically because we have the one campaign card still out. And when I make the decks for the solitaire play, I take one card like from this pile, and then I take two from the reshuffle and put them together. So every time I draw three, you're going to get one of the new cards is the idea behind it. Okay, so now the British deck is all prepared and now we'll do the Emperor the same way although the Emperor of course has one less card. So I always deal the British first. I'm not exactly sure why. I just do. So that's another um, thing with my uh, solo method here is basically to try and make sure that again the new cards get into the mix right off the bat since they haven't been played yet that's how I set up the deck for the last uh, turn of the particular uh, part of that air there. Okay. alright so I'm set here so let me get my score dice here and all I mean by that is I use these to help me remember how many cards I played for each side. Now in this particular case here on this turn the French actually have more victory points. They have two victory points so they will actually get to go first. So let's see what we get. Top three cards off the French deck. Let's see Batavian Republic, British Infantry, uh-huh, no. And Napoleon demands German satellites. Well I can't play that because I don't have enough influence in Germany. If you notice up here in Germany, there's only two red blocks. Okay, uh, But I could gain three influence in France. Now, France doesn't score until the very last time period. Now, of course, again, I could always do the bottom if I want and try to beef some things up. But right now, there's only one campaign card out, and that's a naval one. Um... You know what? Actually, I'm going to go ahead and play this Batavian Republic one. I'm going to think long term here. And I will add three French influence cubes to France because at the end of the game, France is worth 10 victory points that very last turn. So we'll think long term here with that. Okay, now the British, because they do have the campaign card, I could roll the dice right off the bat, remember. And again, if it's a seven or more, <coughs> excuse me, then we could go ahead and choose it. But again, I like to save that as a later option. Um, sometimes I play it the other way. It depends on how the mood strikes me. So let's see what we get here. Mm, third partition of Poland. Expedition Egypt. Nah, that's not going to happen. This gives the French influence. French core form. Not going to do that either. Okay. But third partition of Poland gives three influence in Poland, which would pretty much lock Poland down uh, from that perspective. The other options are economy and military units. Um... You know what? I'm going to go with third partition of Poland and basically try to lock Poland down. 
hopefully for the rest of the game with that three influence because that's huge and of course that will also keep the French from being able to recruit Polish units outside of that Polish immigre card so on to round two of this turn okay Britain seizes French colonies yeah that ain't happening Attack Column Tactics. Ooh, okay, and Privateers. Now, Attack Column Tactics, the French would get two leadership. I like that. Leadership's going to be critical for future battles, especially this naval battle that's going to be coming up here. So I will go ahead and I will play that. And I will move the French leadership and tactic markers up to level 5 now. Alright, the Brits. Let's see. Napoleon demands Italian satellite. Yeah, that ain't happening. Ah, Battle of Hohenlinden and the Pope is removed from Rome. Let's see. Hmm, I do have a number of Austrian troops. I could force a big battle up there in Germany if I wanted to. That's worth some points. But I could also remove the Pope. So I would lose two French influence in, in both Italy and Spain. Uh, Spain, that would be a big deal, because France only has two. Italy, it would weaken them, but not seriously. Um, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and, and get the Pope removed. So, two gone from Spain, and two from Italy. So, those influence cubes are gone. And they're not easy to replace, I might add, too, just for the record, so to speak. All right. Next three French cards. Let's see. Oh, the peace there. The Concordant. Oh, okay. That's helpful. And then the Treaty of Campo for me. Oh, there's a lot of political cards here this time. Um, well, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and play the Concordant and fix the damage that was done in Italy and Spain. So I'm going to put two cubes back in each spot. And of course, once I, just as I say that you know, once influence is hard to get back, of course the, the game makes a liar out of me and makes it very easy for me to get all the French influence back where it belongs. Alright. You know, you know how it goes. Some days are better than others. <laughs> Alright, let's check the last three British, well, three full British cards. Ah, the British could wage the Battle of the Pyramids. Okay, Roman Republic form, not gonna happen. Levy and Mass, that's a card to keep away from the French. Now, they can send Austrian troops to Egypt. That's fine. So they could fight the Battle of the Pyramids. That's worth three victory points. That's a lot. So you know what? I'm going to do it. So let's set up this campaign card. So again, the French are the first ones that have to deploy units. Uh, that's a pretty big fight. So I am going to send a number of units down there. Um, actually, I'll send the bulk of my forces down here to fight the Battle of the Pyramids. Okay. Now the British, we're going to have two units, so I'll roll a four-sided die, giving the highest chance that they will at least send something to the Battle of the Pyramids. And actually they're sending both units. Interesting. So the British are going to send two units down for the Battle of the Pyramids. And then I have two, four, six Austrian forces. So it could be up to six Austrians. And it is four, so they're really going all in on this Battle of the Pyramids bit. Two, three, and four. So it's going to be a big fight here later on. And of course, remember, now that card goes in front of the French. And of course, then the French can play it, if they wish, to reinforce the battle later on. All right. So we got the last French card, the mystery card. And let's roll the dice. Let's see what happens here. I rolled a six, so I won't get to choose the other two cards. They'll be at random. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been fighting this thing now for almost two weeks. I'm hoping it's going to let go of me before too long here. All right. So, got that treaty. Got that peace. A lot of political stuff. What's the mystery card? Oh, Napoleon becomes first consul. So I could pick up an economy and two influence if I wanted. Ooh, that's tempting. 
You know, I think that's what I'll do. I'll play that for the event and pick up an economy. So the French economy goes up to 12. And I get to pick up two influence. And you know what? I think I'm going to take the two influence and negate the coalition influence in Germany. So that will cancel that out. Okay, let's see if the British are going to have any more luck on picking a card. And they do roll a 7, so they could play uh, the Battle of Abukir Bay if they want. However, they're not going to do that because they don't have any naval units. Austria doesn't have any naval units in the game at all. <coughs> so let's see. So the two old cards, Roman Republic form, Napoleon demands Italian satellite troops, and the mystery card is the Polish Lancers. Ah, the player with a majority of influence in Poland gets two Polish units. Okay, I'll go ahead and play that because the coalition forces are a little thin right now. So, let's put them into the cup and see what Polski needs to do that. So, we a two-strength cavalry. Yeah, three strength infantry, not too shabby. Yeah, that was a good call. Okay, so I'll take those, put them face down over here with the coalition and mix them up. So that way I won't know which one I'm drawing, if and when I need to. And we put this card into the discard pile. Okay. Alright, let's see if the French will get to pick their card. It's a 12, so they do get to pick their card. Alright, excellent. So... Let's see. I don't want that. I don't have enough to do that, but I could wait on it. Um, hmm. Hmm. I'm trying to see if I have cards here to let me play any influence. <sighs> this is a tough call here. Because I'd like to put influence in Germany so I could go ahead and potentially recruit these satellite units. Yeah, you know what? That's what I'll do. I'll play this card. I'll play the bottom part, the two influence. And I'll put two influence for France up in Germany. So there they go. So I'm gambling that I'm going to be able to hopefully either choose or draw that recruitment card. Okay, British gold of three. So they'll have to randomly choose their cards here. So one, two, three, yikes. Oh, they still could force that battle. Ooh, the French only have one unit. You know what? That's what we'll do. We'll force that battle. So we'll get ready for this, the Battle of Hohenlinden campaign in Germany. Okay, well, France has to commit their forces first. So France will have to commit their only cavalry unit that they have available. Now, there's only four units here from Austria and Poland. So logically, if I was the coalition player, I'd commit them all, let's be honest. So, so again, you know, with the solo system, you know, also have to be practical as well, too. And now that card goes in front of the French. But the bad news for the French is they only have one turn left. So even if I was able to recruit those German forces, I would not be able to send them up to reinforce the battle. And of course, I don't even know if that's going to happen because I just rolled a 5. Alright, so let's see here. Alright, 1, 2, 3. Hmm... You know, I think I'll take this, because my French forces have gotten rather large. So unfortunately that gamble with Germany didn't pay off. So I'll play this card picking up a victory point, that will take me up to three. And I pick up two more economy, so that should easily help me to sustain the military that I've built. To basically aggressively establish the empire. And the British actually get to choose their card, they chose a nine. So they don't have any forces left, so they obviously won't choose their campaign card. Um, hmm. 
So should I choose the military unit or the economy? Uh, I think I'll choose one British military unit, actually. So, let's see what we get out of that. Get ready for the next time period. Now oh, we got a nice strong British naval unit for next time around. Okay, so that is the end of turn three. And now, of course, we'll resolve our campaign cards and then we will go ahead and do our scoring. I'll show you how that works. Okay, so here we go. So, first of all, campaign cards. Okay, we have the Battle of Abukir. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Bay. So again, we just total up the strength of each side. So the French have four, six, eight, nine, because they have one naval unit. Nine and five is 14. So they have a value of 14. The British have three, four. Uh, let's see, four and four is eight. And then three more, because they always get three more. The naval battle is 11. So 14 to 11 the French will actually win this thing. So the French, based on the card here, will pick up two more economies. So their economy is booming right now. Their economy is only up to 16. The British economy will slide back to a 7. Now the French will lose their weakest unit, which is this one naval. The British would lose their strongest. They only have one to lose. So back goes that fleet. And then these go back over here in front of the French player. So that's that. Okay. All right, so let's do the Battle of the Pyramids here next. Okay. Let's see what's going to happen down here by the Nile. All right, so France has 4, 6, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15. 15 and 5, so they have 20. Let's see what the coalition deployed down here. They've got two and three is five, eight, ten, eleven, thirteen, and four, seventeen. So twenty to seventeen, the French are triumphant. Viva l'Empereur. All right, so the campaign. Three victory points for the French. That's huge because your victory points are what you need to win the game. And they got one more economy. Holy cow. French economy is going wild. Now, the British did lose, so they will get one leadership uh, point out of that. Okay. French lose their weakest unit, which is a one there. So that will be that. And I'll get all the other French forces put back over here. So that one goes back into the reinforcement cup. And the coalition will lose the strongest unit. There's a couple of threes here. And I'll just roll a die to determine which one is actually going to be lost. Here, so we'll go odd or even. So odd's the Austrian. Even's the British, and it is indeed the British. Okay. So the Austrian force is there, but they have been defeated. Okay. All right. So, so far, so good for the Empire. But things are not going to go so good here in about 10 seconds. Because now we have this battle in Germany. This is going to sting clearly, because the French only have one unit. So the French will have a strength of two, three for the cavalry, and then five, that's eight. You only got eight, yikes. Whereas the coalition has five, eight, ten, okay, that's obviously enough, all right? So, ooh, this is bad news too. So three victory points for the coalition, and they get two influence in Germany. Which ties, ah, which ties the French, which means, of course, here they're not going to get that. The French do get one leadership point, so that will help them later on. And the French will lose the only unit they have to lose. The coalition loses the weakest unit, which is either the Polish cavalry or the Austrian infantry. And again, I'll roll a die to figure out which one that's about to be. So again, just odd or even. And it's odd. So the Austrian one is eliminated. And the Polish one goes back over in front of the British player. And that's the end of that campaign.
Okay. All right. So we played our campaigns and we have scored them. Now, next thing we have to do is the economy. Okay. Now with the economy, let me move you over here. Basically, all you have to do is you take the strength of your economy, like the French is right now, 17, and count up how many military units you actually have of either French or British. You don't count satellites or allies or anything like that. So, the French have one, two, three, four, five, six, they have seven, and they have an economy of 17. Okay, so if the total is positive, which is a positive 10, 17 to 7 there, okay, those points are added to the player's victory point total. So the French just picked up 10 victory points. That's crazy. But there they go, flying up to 16. Okay, now the British economy sits at 7 right now, and they have two forces. So 7 minus 2 is 5. So the British will pick up 5 victory points going from 4 to 9. So currently, victory points are 16 to 9 on the chart at this moment here. Okay? Alright. Then the last thing you do with a scoring round is you go through each area and see what it's worth for that particular go round. So for example, actually we'll just use Italy here. Okay? Each country has three numbers okay for each of the three scoring rounds so like now this first scoring round is the end of turn three Italy's worth three points whoever has the most influence and then it'll be worth four next time with the green cards and with the red cards it'll also be four okay and what I like to do just to kind of keep things neat and again so you know keep things orderly for solo play that's always a challenge <coughs> excuse me is I just follow the little chart in the book. So let's just bounce around here. Now France, no points during this opening thing. Same thing with Britain, okay? Germany, now up here in Germany, both sides have four blocks of influence, okay? So nobody has a majority, nobody gets any points there. So nothing going on in Germany. Italy, the coalition has three. The empire has seven, so they will get the three victory points for that so 16 3 that's 19 okay Poland where the coalition clearly dominates is worth two points so the coalition picks up two more victory points up to 11 Scandinavia is not worth anything here nobody has anything up there anyway Egypt is worth two points and the French do have two blocks of influence down there so they now improve to 21 victory points Spain Barely over here, if you see on the fringes there of the screen, the coalition barely has the edge there, so they pick up two much needed victory points to take them up to 13. Austria has no influence from anybody, which is was a bit of an oversight and a mistake. Sometimes it's easy to forget that you know when you have a country allied with the coalition, you still have to put influence in. Because there's still all kinds of, you know, tugs of war and intrigues at court. Um, or quite frankly, to use uh, the decision-making model um, that Allison and Zaliko did for their Essence of Decision book about the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, it, it's important who sits where in the action channel. Uh, who has position, so to speak. So the influence cubes reflect all of those kind of things. So, unfortunately, a little oversight there by both sides. Nobody put anything in Austria, so nobody gets anything. Alright. Now, Prussia, the coalition has a majority, so they will pick up two more victory points, take them up to 15. And last but not least, of course, the bear. The coalition has three blocks in Russia, picking up two more victory points, taking them to 17. So, after... The first scoring round here at the end of round three. The current score is the French having 21 victory points and the coalition has 17. So even when it started, first looked like the French were going to run away with things, the coalition was able to rally, especially with some of the other um, powers later on on the scoring chart. Okay, And that's that. So we now move on to the fourth turn and we will bring the green cards 
into play. Okay. Now, a couple last words here before I finish up. Um, I'm not going to do like a full review like I've done some other games because, to be quite frank about it, I don't think this game is meaty enough to warrant a full review. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, because as you can see from the gameplay here, this is very light, breezy, and, and easy. Which can be, you know, a good and a bad thing depending on what you're looking for. You know, this is clearly not the Napoleonic Wars. Or it's not um, Age of Napoleon. It's not even War and Peace. And this is much lighter than any of those. But at the same time, I like it because there's a lot of decisions to make. There's a lot of interplay going on here. You know, you got to keep an eye on your economy. You got to keep your military build up. Uh, you know, as a French player, you've got to. And unfortunately, I didn't get the campaign card to campaign in Austria and try and knock them out last time. Okay, and of course the the British never managed to time the uh, diplomacy card that would have brought somebody else into the fray, even though they had majority influence in Spain and Prussia and Russia. They could have brought one of them in, which really would have been a problem with some of the battles, but. They never managed to time that out. So there's a lot of elements here. And granted, in a two-player game where you have, you know, you'll be able to see all ten cards at once, you know, there'll be it'll be a little different animal because you'll be able to organize things a little bit better. I don't mind not being able to organize everything all the time because in reality, um, and again, kind of going back to the book Essence of Decision, which by the way, if you're interested in decision making theory, is a fantastic book. Going back to that book, the point being that, you know, most of us think of government decisions based on the rational actor model. You know, when we talk about decisions made, we say the president did this, or Napoleon did this, or, you know, Lord Pitt did this. But the reality is, it's not really, there really is no rational actor model. There is no one person. There's a lot of moving parts going on, a lot of things happening, um, you know. To quote um, General Black from Failsafe, whenever he says, don't, don't kid yourself, you know, how we say a war can be fought and won is making policy. And he's right. Because, you know, whatever options are available to the decision makers, that does create the parameters. It does create the decision making structure. You know, if something's not possible at all, then it can't be done. Or if it's, you know, it's a very... A difficult thing for a government to pull off, etc. So I don't mind that as far as like having limited cards, and it keeps the tension I think pretty uh, high too, and it keeps um, it keeps things interesting as well. And yeah, it seems like missed opportunities, but there's lots of missed opportunities in politics. And in my first two games I played with my solo method, you know, both games are very tight. I can't think of the first score off the top of my head, but the last game I played before this one. The final score was the British winning 62 to 56, so that's only six point difference, you know. So that's that's a pretty tight game. Um, one thing I do like about this game is this is a good war game to play with non war gamers because it's very straightforward how the combat is resolved, uh, how the scoring is resolved. You know, there isn't a, you know 800,000 you know die roll modifiers like when you're playing ASL you know modifier for the size of my machine gun and how heavy the boots are on six of my guys in my squad or something you know it's very streamlined and, but at the same time it gives you a nice feel for the Napoleonic era you know you still need to be doing things as both sides you know the British building the coalition the French launching campaigns to knock members out of the coalition as well as try to pull you know, other countries their way and, you know, get, um, uh, tap into the nationalism of Italy and Germany to get troops, and Poland for that matter too, to get troops for uh, their armies and, and to support them. So, so in the end, uh, I do like this game. I'm, this is a keeper for me. I'm glad I took a flyer on it because I, I basically did take a flyer on it. I didn't give it a whole lot of thought and research before I pulled the trigger. Um, of course, there wasn't many videos to watch, quite frankly, so, I mean, that's part of the reason I'm making these videos. But, overall, I like it. It will stay in my collection. If I want something meatier, I have Age of Napoleon. But if I want something a little bit lighter and, quite frankly, does a better job of um, giving the feel and the calculation of the interplay between 
economy and military units and diplomacy, uh, this is the game I would play. I'm looking forward to trying this with my wife. She likes games that are driven by cards. Um, so she likes Twilight Struggle. Uh, so I'm looking forward to giving this a go with her as well, too, because I think this will be a really good two-player game uh, to do that with. But I enjoy playing it solo as well. One other thing, too, is that I made the solo method up that I shared with you because you can't use Stuka Joe's because there's no operation value on any of the cards. Uh, Stuka Joe's system requires op values on cards. Because otherwise, you know, when it says, you know, choose the lowest top value card, well, eh, that doesn't exist in this game. Those don't, you know, there's no numbers on the card. So, hence why I made my little system up, and I'm still tweaking, and I probably still will tweak it further down the road. So, bottom line on this is, if you like the Napoleonic era, if you want something lighter, but it still gives you the feel and the tension, this is the way to go. If you want something meatier, you want to be able to build your core and march them all over the place and stuff, no. This is not the game, um, the game for you. So, so that's victory and glory, the first third of the game um, here demonstrated for you. Now, next time around, I'm not sure what I'll be sharing with you. Um, I did place a big game order recently, and one of the other games that came was the Central Pacific um, game from World at War, the latest issue. Uh, which has a system that's similar, but I can already see from reading the rules some differences to the Midway Solitaire one that came out a few years ago. So I'll be looking forward to trying that, and probably at some point I'll do a video on that too, if that is the game I go to next. I'm not 100% sure that's going to happen, because I am waiting on a few more games to come. Two from Hollandspiel, in particular the NATO Air Commander, and then um, their other game that they have about the Leipzig campaign, which among the Napoleonic Wars... To me, that's one of the most interesting campaigns, that whole 1813 um, uh, time period from start to finish of that year, uh, I think is extremely pivotal, and I've always found that interesting, so I'm looking forward to trying this game. I like um, Leipzig 20 from the Napoleonic 20 series, so you know maybe I'll crack that open too and share it with you. I'm not sure if I'm shifting away topics from World War II to you know, Napoleonic era, maybe. I, mean, I am a topic-kind-of-driven guy, so we'll see how that goes. All right. So, once again, I highly recommend this game if you're looking for a nice, light, but tense and involved game on the Napoleonic Wars. So, this is Tim Korchnoy from Bare Bones Wargaming saying thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. I'm not sure where from. Perhaps from the Central Pacific, perhaps from the skies above Germany during the Cold War when it goes hot, or maybe once again marching with a little corporal. We'll see. Thanks for watching.